The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, UNU Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah on Armed Global Radio. So today I'm going to talk about um, what do you do when working with recruiters. So if you do find that you are being working with directly with a recruiter and not the hiring manager, then you have to watch out for these several red flags and. Um, while the recruiting industry has evolved, uh, recruiter, recruiter stereotypes still exist. They are based on exaggerated truth perpetuated by a small number of recruiters, but don't let a few bad apples distort your view of the whole profession. The best protection against working with a bad recruiter is being able to identify them and knowing when to move on. You know you're working with a bad recruiter if they talk more than they listen. A recruiter's job is to get to know you. The only way they can do that is by listening to you tell you tell your story. If they seem more interested in telling you how the relationship works and only ask basic things about your job search like salary expectations and desired title, don't waste your time. When you leave your meeting, Ask yourself, does this recruiter know enough about me to retell my career story to an employer? Would they be able to advocate on my behalf? If the employer has questions or concerns, you want your recruiter to understand what you're looking for. If they don't, there is no way they can adequately represent you or your interests. The next thing to look out for is if they keep calling you for jobs you don't want. It's one thing if you told the recruiter to send anything and everything your way. But assuming that you, like most job seekers, have very specific ideas about what direction you want your career to go in, this should be a red flag. If they keep calling you for jobs you have no interest in, take it as a sign that they really don't know you or care to. Move on to another recruiter who will respect what you are looking for. Uh, for me, I'm a recruiter and a career coach and a resume writer. For me to do as a recruiter, I'm just basically helping others to get to know them, to know exactly what they are looking for. And especially those that I write resumes for, I already interview them from the beginning to know what they do, what their qualifications are, what their credentials are. And based on that, I can direct them to the right hiring manager. And for me, I don't need to keep doing interviews upon interviews because I already did what I will, what I already do the resume with them. So uh, basically, um, a recruiter needs to know exactly what kind of job you are looking for and what you want. Basically, they need to find your dream job. And if that recruiter that you are with is not that t- that typically good one, then you should know that you should be looking for someone else. And if you do want to find out more details about recruiter, how to find recruiters, then you can just message me on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and I will help you. The next red flag is, um, you know that if you get submitted to jobs without your consent, then are bullied into going to the interview, that's already not a good sign. Sometimes for competitive reasons and personal gain, recruiters will submit profiles to open roles without consent from the job seeker. Should the client be interested, candidates feel pressured to interview for the job, regardless if they want it or not. It's important to distinguish a recruiter who knows you from one who is selfish. 
A recruiter may urge you to consider a role that you are not completely sold on simply because they know both you and the client and firmly believe it's a good match. In the latter situation, the recruiter is looking out for you, not themselves. Be sure to know the difference. The next red flag is if they keep calling to ask you the same questions. Recruiters meet so many people that it can be hard to keep them straight. A certain amount of information may naturally fall through the cracks. However, repeatedly asking the same information either indicates a lack of interest or lack of good organization, neither or neither of which helps you find a new role. The next red flag is they are not responsive. Recruiters are extremely busy juggling new candidate interviews, prepping candidates for job interviews, meeting with clients, and handling all the administrative tasks that go along with it. That leaves little time for continued chit-chat on the phone. Of course, your recruiter should be available to talk about interview, prep, post-interview, debriefs, and your job search updates, but if you feel your recruiter isn't responsive at all, it's time to end the relationship. Tuning in on Armed Radio and Let's Talk Careers with Sarah every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. I talk about careers and job hunting. If you would like to ask a question or would like to hear about previous shows that you have missed, you can find me on Facebook at Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. You can learn about jobs, tips, and advice on my page. If you have a career-related question, you can just message me on Facebook. Now, I'm going to move on and talk about more about recruiters. And there are some reasons for recruiters why you didn't get the job. So the job hunting process can be a roller coaster of highs and lows. And every rejection along the way can make you feel more and more insecure. But while there are situations where you didn't get the job because of something you did or didn't do or say, there are also times when it's more about another candidate. So here's why you didn't get the position according to recruiters and experts. So number one is you didn't do your homework. You have the power to learn as much as possible about your potential employer before the interview day comes. And if you don't, you are at huge disadvantage. Um, other recruiters believe that um, that you shouldn't essentially give up an opportunity with an employer because you failed to do your research properly. You don't want the reason you didn't get the job to be because of something easily avoidable. Today, there is no excuse for not being prepared for an interview. Start by reviewing the company website and really dig into the content. Companies often provide profiles of their key executives, which you should read carefully. Look for the company's press releases too, where you may find information that doesn't show up anywhere else. Um, another, uh, another way, another reason is um, you use too much jargon. Jargon can make you feel like you are trying way too hard at work. And enough ridiculous words could potentially send eyes rolling. Uh, there is a Glass article featured advice from a CEO of Verbo, and he comments on why you shouldn't be, why you shouldn't use too many words like this, saying "Don't try to look smarter than you really are." And so another reason is another applicant stole your thunder. Sometimes it's not about you. It's about how another candidate ha has won over the employer. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the recruiters said that the company is in love with another candidate, and there are situations that might play out. So many times, candidates are left in limbo because the hiring team is heavily courting another candidate, and the company isn't telling you where you stand in the application process one way or another. Mm -hmm. Because should this dream candidate back out, they'll be able to fall back on you. The next reason is you're better suited for another employer. There is a large discrepancy between what you want and how the employer operates. 
um, loosely structured culture and more, but uh, the company has long been established as a traditional corporate work environment with a structured hierarchy and a typical 8 to 5 workday. Clearly, the right fit is not for you because it's nothing personal, we just don't get along. So instead of getting too hung up on the differences in the work culture you seek and the one the employer has, move on and look for positions at places that match your vision more. The next reason is you just didn't mesh with the hiring manager. Sometimes you don't get a job even though you technically fit the bill. And um, there is an article in the news that says oh, why you weren't the right fit for the manager. Uh, the unfortunate truth about getting rejected is that even when you match every single bullet point on the job description, there are things the hiring manager is looking for that are difficult to describe in words. And the next reason is you weren't on time. This is an obvious one. Whatever you do, don't be late. This is strike one in terms of things that work against you before the interview has even started. And being late is disrespectful and will gain you no points in terms of getting the job. This is an instant red flag to any hiring manager that you are not the most dependable candidate in the pool. Another and the last reason that I'm going to say is your materials contain errors. Again, this is also a no-brainer. How is an employer supposed to trust you with high-stakes projects and assignments if it's clear that you struggle with spelling? So, HuffPost article mentions the same thing, like spelling mistakes and other issues on your cover letter and resume makes you look sloppy, among other points. So, uh, you have to have a clear and concise and result-focused Nothing has to be more than that. And many of these mistakes can be avoided. So steer clear of them so you are in a better position to land the job you want. One of the staples of a job search is the cover letter. And these days, hiring managers receive about 7 billion resumes a day. And they spend less than a millisecond glancing over each one as they decide who makes it past the prelims and into the running for the job. That cover letter or cover email will immediately be trashed. As far as we are concerned, however, there is just one good reason not to send a cover letter to a prospective employee and if the job posting explicitly says not to send one. Every day, the cover letter can still be a powerful tool for job seekers. A way to build rapport with a prospective employer and put your resume in context. The worst thing that can happen if you send a cover letter is that it doesn't get read. Big deal, no harm, no foul. So are you going to include a cover letter the next time you send a resume? So let me tell you some tips and advice on how to craft a cover letter that will get you noticed. Number one is make it pretty. Before your cover letter ever gets read, someone's going to glance at it. If your cover letter looks like it's going to be a pain to read, you are already lost the game. Long and broken blocks of text are a surefire way to turn off a reader, especially when your reader is one of those overworked hiring managers. Your sentences should be short and create separate paragraphs. There should be just three to five with a space. There is no need to indent. Bulleted lists make for easy, breezy, more scannable text. The second thing you can do is make it original. When it comes to cover letters, recycling is not a good practice. Each new job opportunity calls for a new cover letter. Study the job posting, tailor your cover letter to it, using similar terminology and tone, but still be yourself. Most letters can follow a standard three-paragraph format. Introduce yourself and tell them why you are writing. Match your qualifications for the, to the job, use specific examples and maybe one of those bulleted lists, and restate how you are a perfect fit for the job 
ask for an interview and let them know how you will follow up. The third thing you can do is make it relevant. Your cover letter shouldn't just be a catalog of your skills and experience. That's what your resume is. A cover letter is your chance to draw a line between your skills and experience and the qualities that the employer is looking for in a candidate. Remember to keep it brief. If your cover letter is effective, you'll have a chance to elaborate on your qualifications during an interview. If the fourth thing is make it complete, be sure to include your full name and contact phone and email in the cover letter. Also, if you know someone inside the company who doesn't mind vouching for you, include their name in the cover letter. Uh, also, end your cover letter by reiterating your qualifications, letting the company know how and when you will follow up and that you are requesting an interview. And the last thing is make it perfect. Warning, bad grammar, typos, and misspellings will kill your cover letter. So don't just bang out your cover letter and send it off. Finish the first draft and then set it aside for a few minutes. When you give it another read, be on the lookout for mistakes and opportunities to, to strip out excesses words and to strengthen the points you make. Try re reading it out loud. Go ahead, use a spell check. Be sure to double check your spelling. Spell check doesn't catch everything. Finally, ask the least one, at least one other person to read a letter before you send out. So, cover letter is very crucial. And sometimes people tell me, uh, some candidates that I write resumes for them, that they tell me, I want to include this on the resume, I want to include that on the, re on the resume. And I say, no. If you don't have space to do to put it on the resume the rest can be mentioned in the cover letter and if you feel like the cover letter is not going to make make uh, something authentic then mention it at the interview nothing should be missed out there are ways to mention them in writing in the verbalizing it or uh, showing it in a portfolio it doesn't matter there are ways to communicate it. So cover letter is very essential. And if your job tells you to send cover letter and resume, please don't make that mistake and you're just sending a resume. A resume with no cover letter, no matter how much you spend on writing that resume and it's very looking impressive, you're not going to get a call. This resume is going to be in the junk folder. It's going to be in the trash. It's not going to be printed. It's going to be deleted. So you have to send with a cover letter. And I don't know how people miss out or the, it, it shows you, you don't follow instructions and it shows you don't actually understand what a cover letter is. And if you are sending just a resume, it shows you are lacking in communication skills, instruction skills and also you are not following directions and you are poor in writing that's what it seems like so don't let them judge you by that send a cover letter if you have a problem and you don't know how to write a cover letter then uh, this recording will be um, this show is going to be recorded and it's going to be posted on my page let's talk careers with Sarah and also you can message me on let's talk careers with sarah and i can help you or you can go to my group let's talk careers inner circle and you can ask the group members and they can help you out as well another thing i want to tell you the only time you don't need to send a cover letter is when you are on linkedin if you are applying jobs for linkedin and they don't require the majority of them says easy uh, send or easy something so with that profile with a profile that you have on linkedin that's when you don't send a cover letter because they don't ask for it all they ask is your profile of your linkedin and if your linkedin is different 
than your resume, then it's not right. Because when you show up at the interview, they will ask for a hard copy of your resume. So you need to have it aligned together and not any different. Have you thought about how you are going to land your next six-figure position in 2018? How far along are you with preparations? Do you have a plan? The time to act is now. How much more successful do you think you could be if your executive LinkedIn profile generated double or even triple the number of quality job leads you are currently getting? How much closer would you be to finding that dream job if you were able to choose among multiple offers from potential employers? Learn how to take control of your job search by listening to my show every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Armed Radio or message me on Let's Talk Careers with Sarah and join my group Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle on Facebook to post any career questions for free advice. Some people say that writing a resume is really easy. It's not that hard. And for me, um, my answer is sure, you can write a resume and save money on a professional writer. But for some, it takes about six to eight weeks to get the resume perfectly written. And for me, it's just a waste of time. Why would you waste six to eight weeks? Imagine how many days is that? It's more than 30 days. It's about like 40 to 50 days wasted on just writing a resume. And uh, when you could have just uh, had somebody write for you for one week and then had have gone for an interview and within those six weeks, you, have, you could have been already starting a position that you already love. And um, someone called me to fix his resume and write the cover letter ASAP after he had worked on it six weeks ago. And I'm like, seriously, you wanted ASAP? It's just you just waited six weeks of your time writing your own resume of two pages. And people claim they want the job badly, yet they waste time and don't feel like investing in the, in the, in the, in themselves. I feel so bad for them. And their res resume could have been done six weeks ago, and that person could have been employed already in his dream job. So I really want to advise you, don't waste time. It's so precious. And there are so many things we can do with the time. Just delegate to someone who is strong in your weakness. And really, seriously, a resume, yes, it seems easy. But those people who say it's so easy to write a resume and when you send out and nobody calls you, you don't know what you did wrong. You may assume all kinds of things. You may assume uh, the job is already being filled and uh, probably there are other candidates who are better than you. Probably they don't need you anymore because the job is being filled. And you can find all kinds of excuses, but in reality, it even didn't reach their desk. Because they use the system. If you apply online, there is a system called ATS. It's applicant tracking system. And if that system doesn't recognize the keywords that it's looking for in order to email it to their to the hiring manager, to the recruiter, then you just wasted time, not just for writing, but you wasted time for even searching for jobs because you are continuing searching for jobs with the same resume that you wrote and you get the same results of having nobody calling you. It's been a month, two months, three months, a year, and it's just a waste of time and I feel so bad. I tell, I, tell, I tell you and all my inner circle group on Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle on Facebook, I tell that to everybody. If you want an audit, at least to have somebody, a professional, to take a look at your work. To, if you think you are such a good writer that you know how to write a resume for yourself, have a professional review it for you for free. Let them see exactly so they can tell you what went wrong. I have been offering it on my Facebook page 
and I had some candidates who had emailed me that their resume and their resume is absolutely what I see on everybody's resume whoever sends it to me to the to be to become my client really it's not aligned properly the words are off and it shows you have no professionalism and the resume the job experience is completely completely not relevant you know there's somebody who worked in a daycare and then she worked in a uh, nursing home and then she worked in a medical office and then she worked in a dental office i was kind of confused and i asked her your resume needs to highlight for the job you are applying for you need to decide do you want to be in the medical field or do you want to be in an educational field educational field she wanted both i told her you cannot do both you have to decide which one because each re- each skill is going to be uh, describing your strength and you don't want to confuse the recruiter or the hiring manager and another person asked me, do I need to have a cover letter? Why is it so important to have a cover letter? Cover letter is very important. If it specifically is asked on a job posting, send a cover letter and a resume. It shows, if you, don't, if you do send a cover letter, it shows you know how to follow instructions. That's the first thing, the catch. You know, if you don't show, if you don't email the cover letter, it shows you don't know how to follow instructions. It shows you don't know how to communicate properly because you don't know how to write. Basically, it shows so many judgments can be can be like given about you and you don't want that. And the only time that you don't need, like I said before, is only on LinkedIn. If it's not being asked, if it's just that send a resume, then you send a resume. But cover letter is needed only when they ask. There, there is a reason why they ask for a cover letter. Perhaps they are posting so many jobs, different titles, and they don't know exactly where you are applying for what position. And uh, this is very relevant to know to for them to know exactly where you are applying for. And this is the, the reality of it. And I just want to emphasize also on LinkedIn. There are a lot of nursing jobs on LinkedIn, and it's not just nursing, any other job on LinkedIn. And you have to realize, is your profile impressive? Because as I said before, you need to just apply through easy apply, and it, your profile has to go through, uh, your profile is just emailed to the recruiter, and your profile has to match the resume. And if you don't know how to make it, your profile impressive just go on my profile page uh, Sarah Yusupov and see if you have uh, the same impression on your re- on your profile as you have on m- on mine and a resume has to be very strong conveying the message what you are uh, looking for for a job now another candidate I had she was very happy with me and she said um, she posted uh, a review on Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. She said how amazing I am as a writer, and I'm doing my job properly as it's supposed to be, and I'm give I'm always delivering the due date even before I promise. She didn't believe that um, I could do for her resume that was professionally done, and um, after she gave a try to do with me the resume, um, she submitted to so many jobs and she started having calls after calls after calls after calls for an interview. And one of them actually wrote for her in the email that she's got a very impressive resume. So basically what you you know i tell everybody set your worries aside and get your skills shine and um if you feel that you need a resume to be revamped you know just do it don't do it yourself because you don't know till today you did it yourself and there was no calls and there was no interviews that were like very fast but with my results with my writing skills you will have um, the results even much faster and you will be very amazed. And also, I want to say 
that when you have a, a, an interview coming up, then just message me on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and then I can guide you through with the sessions on how to pass an interview. Now, another thing I want to say that um, another candidate just uh, asked, what should I do when my job isn't what I thought it would be? And she says that, dear HR professional, I took my current job thinking it will lead to numerous career advancement opportunities. And now I fear that the job I ended up with is far different from the one I was originally presented. I've tried to make the best of it, but I've determined it's definitely time to look for a new opportunity. How can I do this without being deemed a flight risk by my current or future employers? Uh, sang, catfished, and concerned. And the answer for that type sometimes happens that you are going to take a job and then that job is basically not what you thought it would be. So I, my answer would be that i um, sorry to hear about your experience. It's always disheartening when the opportunity you were expecting isn't the one you end up with especially when you were told otherwise. Luckily, this has happened to quite a few people before you. So I have a quick two-step process to help you out. Number one is exhaust your option at your current company. You have said that you took your current role with, you, with the understanding that it will lead to career advancement opportunities. This can come in many forms, promotions, learning opportunities, connections, internal transfers, etc. Now think about what excited you about this opportunity in the first place and then have an honest conversation with your manager about what you are looking for. There may be opportunities for you at your current company that you don't know about. The only way to be sure is to ask. If there is really nothing there for you, if you have done that and you are sure that your company can't offer you anything that you are interested in, it's probably time to start updating your resume and seeing what else is out there. This, so there are some articles that you can find online that can help you start uh, conducting that search without getting in the way of your current job. For example, how to job hunt when you can't leave your job yet. That's one article. Another article, all your tricky questions about job hunting on the job answered. Another article is how to get out of work for a job interview without weaving a web of lies. Now, the second thing that you can do is prepare your story. Truthfully, hiring managers will probably throw you a side eye when they see your dates. So it's important to tell your story the way you want them to see to see it in both your application materials, especially your cover letter, and when you are networking. And I know networking is the worst, but in a situation like this, it's the best way to get your foot in the door. And if you're worried about answering that dreaded, why are you leaving your current job? Question during interviews, remember to be honest without skewing to a negative. This article, that you, I, I gave you the three articles, like have some good responses you can use to talk about your reasoning in an authentic way without throwing your employer under the bus. If career advancement is what you want in your next role, the best way to make sure you get it, you get is to ask about, so while you're interviewing it, what, what, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the best way to make sure you get it is to ask about it while you are interviewing. And I know, I know your current gig told you they had these opportunities for you too, but you can do some research to find out if other companies are telling the truth or not. Look at the employer's social feeds, articles, and news profile. Shameless plug, I know, to see how, what authentically coming through about why it's a great place to work. Follow up with people you have interviewed with and ask them about their own career advancement at the company. It's one thing for a potential employer to tell you about growth opportunities. It's another thing to hear from other employers 
who have gone through it. It's a shame that we have to go through a lot of things that people say and they don't follow. It's really not right. But we live in a world that we can't really help it. And this is just so many times I just look at it and I can't really help much. But you can just look out for yourself and do some research about the company, about the people, about the employers who review on Glassdoor, for example. Or um, there are other postings that people do for their company and they are posting what they feel about the company in itself. Now, if you want to do promotion, to get promoted, and I know promotion is so darn hard, you may think, but in truth, it is not. And there are so many ways to get yourself promoted, and one way is you promote yourself. All you need is the right mindset of the position title that you want, and taking responsibility to every problem that may have happened because of your team, and skills that the position requires, such as leadership skills or management. And most importantly, the knowledge of the position and knowledge of problem solving and common sense. And last thing is the credentials necessary for that position. Now, sorry to say, but if you want to be an employee, you need a degree. And if you do have all this and still stuck, then message me on Facebook, let's talk careers with Sarah and I will guide you through and you can also join my group uh, let's talk careers inner circle so that you can connect with other members who have the same problem and post questions in there and get the responses from the members as well You are tuning in on Armed Radio and Let's Talk Careers with Sarah every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. I talk about careers and job hunting. If you would like to ask a question or would like to hear about previous shows that you have missed, you can find me on Facebook at Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. You can learn about jobs, tips, and advice on my page. If you have a career-related question, you can just message me on Facebook. I want also to uh, remind you, and not actually remind you, to announce that if you are um, a nurse, LPN, CNA, uh, respiratory therapist, rehab therapist, there is um, a job fair in Townhouse Center for Rehab and Nursing Job Fair, and it's actually today and tomorrow. So today already passed, so tomorrow, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, they are looking for compassionate, professional, and enthusiastic personnel. You just need to bring an updated resume, professional license, certifications, and photo ID. And interviews will be, on, will be held on site. And that's in Townhouse Center for Rehab and Nursing. That's in Uniondale, New York. If you are interested, they are hiring also a nurse manager unit. Once um, one of the members of the uh, Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle has posted, um, how do you reduce your resume two to three pages when you are in the field like education and have so much experience? I need help. So sometimes you do the same job, but you have um, different... You have the same position but different job. How do you condense that? So my suggestion for that is to condense it as much as possible and make it more relevant to your current position because whatever you did in the past 20 years, 15 years, and it's been, let's say, you've been working in each job two years in each different in a different job with the same role, it's not relevant to repeat yourself so many times. So it's better to condense your job role and then put your um, employment into categories. And I can just explain to you more about it, how it's done. If you just go to Let's Talk Careers uh, with Sarah and message me there on Facebook, I can, I'll can i be able to help you with that. Another uh, member 
asked tomorrow I have second round interview recruiter call me earlier today to inform me what should I expect and what questions should I ask and or be prepared to answer so uh, there might be my answer to this is that there might be a second round as a group interview with the hiring manager department manager might be so they might ask you similar questions or they might ask you uh, more questions that might be relevant to a particular role and a question should be asked is basically how long is the, if there is more positions out there to grow in the future and how long is this position has been open and you can now with a second round interview you can ask about your salary expectations and another candidate member of the group asked uh, hello everyone I have a question about accepting a job offer so after completing an interview I receive an email that the company wants to offer me the position however they did not include the compensation package what is the best way to ask about the compensation package and also let them know I'm interested in accepting the offer. So here is the same answer. I would say only if you have a second round interview. And I personally would suggest that you do not talk about your salary. And if they do tell you, if you do want to ask just not to waste time on this position, just go to glassdoor.com and find out how much on average they pay. And when it comes for them, to mention about your salary, you can negotiate to match whatever the glass door was showing you if it's less. And I always recommend to negotiate and not wait for them to tell you a yes and that's it. You know, you always have to negotiate. That's how you get your pay much faster. And um, there are other here members who are asking, another question is, I'm starting a job search and I have a question. Is it okay to apply for jobs on site like Indeed when the job has been posted for 25 to 30 days? If a job is posted for 20 plus days, is that a negative thing? So some of the members had answered that question. And one said that I apply for jobs that have been posted for that long. However, it's best to apply for a job within three days of it being posted, according to LinkedIn. I don't see a thing wrong with. The employer could have posted it before and had to repost it, but indeed doesn't reset the days from when it was first posted. Apply for the jobs on LinkedIn too. Happy searching. Also, I usually check the employer's website to see if the job is still posted in there as well. Sometimes jobs in Indeed may still be posted as available when it may not be. I've been told by a recruiter directly that as long as the job is still posted on the company site, no matter how old the job is, they are still recruiting for it. Have you thought about how you are going to land your next six-figure position in 2018? How far along are you with preparations? Do you have a plan? The time to act is now. How much more successful do you think you could be if your executive LinkedIn profile generated double or even triple the number of quality job leads you are currently getting? How much closer would you be to finding that dream job if you were able to choose among multiple offers from potential employers? Learn how to take control of your job search by listening to my show every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on Armed Radio or message me on Let's Talk Careers with Sarah and join my group Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle on Facebook to post any career questions for free advice. Now, I am going to shift my topic to co-workers. Um, offices are plagued with annoying, annoyingly noisy co-workers who chew gum too loudly, use their outdoor voice for indoor conversations, and keep you distracted from getting your actual work done. It's an epidemic that strikes, um, that strikes the relationship and all of us 
So one study found that the lack of sound privacy was the biggest frustration for employees in open cubicles. Even though these noises drive us crazy, we may choose to suffer in silence because we know it can be socially inappropriate to start uh, an office war over the gum chewing. But there is another way. So there is another there is a person who has given an uh, an advice and she says a couple of tips that it will be great. Her name is Alison Green. Um, she asks to make a request light and casual. So before you bring this up with a lip smacking gum chewing offender, take some perspective on your request. Recognize that this may be a tricky conversation, but it should not be an aggressive or mean one. You are asking someone to change their behavior for you. Respect what you are asking of them and do not make a big deal of the behavior itself. This is a request, not a battle. When Green role plays an employee asking her co-workers to lower their voice, she keeps her voice breezy. She even adds in a laugh to make her tone slightly self-deprecating when she says, I know this is weird. The sound of gum being chewed is like nails on blackboard to me. Is there any chance I can ask you to try to chew it more quietly? Green says that the laughingly casual tone shows that you are not taking the behavior too seriously because gum chewing does not merit a serious tone. It signals that you haven't lost perspective. You realize that you might not be nitpicking. You could even make it all about yourself, sort of about your own neuroses. For some of us, being annoyed by gum chewing is a part of our neurosis. Medically, it's called misophonia a selective sound sensitivity syndrome that triggers a fight or flight response to certain noises. For those who have it, the sound of gum chewing fills them with rage. Even the sound of a banana being eaten can take them, can make them see red. Unfortunately, offices are filled with triggers like this. If you are dealing with misophonia, you can use Green's tips to keep yourself cool in your request, even as your body is telling you to act out. So don't be shy to ask anything about this kind of um, request to keep it, keep the noise down. And this is usually respectful and no need to be shying out about this. Now I'm going to talk about the attire at work. Uh, we all know that it's entirely possible to mess up in the personal style department at work. In fact, new research from staffing firm office team showed that 44% top managers have approached an employee because of inappropriate clothing. Now it's the summertime coming up, so this is a perfect topic to talk about. So it makes sense that style could also have a big influence on moving up the corporate ladder. A staggering 80% of managers and 86% of employees said they think that what you wear to work can impact your chances of scoring a promotion. Independent research firms surveyed two groups, more than a thousand American adult office employees in addition to 300 senior managers and 300 HR managers at U.S. companies with 20 or more employees. Here are some of the points that stood out. While workers spend an average of 11 minutes daily picking out clothes to the office, some people need to make better choices. 32 32% of managers say they have gone so far as to make someone go back home because of what they wore. Those ages 18 to 34 spend more time choosing work clothes than any other group at 13 minutes daily on average, while those 55 and older spend the least amount of time at 7 minutes daily on average. Men spend an average of 12 minutes daily, while women spend an average of 9 minutes. Uh, dressing professionally establishes credibility and helps others envision you in a role with greater responsibility. While many organizations have relaxed their dress codes, especially for warmer months, employees shouldn't assume casual attire or the latest fashion trends are okay for the office. It's always a good idea to follow company policies and observe what colleagues in more senior positions typically wear. Even though different groups spend varying amounts of time choosing clothes for work, it's wise to draw the line somewhere. 
The research shows that flip-flops, tank tops, and short shorts have fallen out of favor over the course of the last five years, among others, according to HR managers. But on the other hand, they say that tennis shoes, jeans, and leggings are among the clothing items that are more acceptable in office setting today versus back then. So while 67% of workers say they have supply of clothes that are only for work, making the right choices could mean this difference between getting promotion and failing to. If you really want to get promoted, you need to know what your role is and how you have to look. Like they say, dress up for success. So if you know that it is inappropriate, if you don't feel like you want to get promoted, still respect the dress cost for your position. Now, for the next 10 minutes, I'll be talking about how you can level yourself up. Um, do you want to become a multimillionaire? So you have to do these 15 things immediately. That's our, this is article from thelatters.com. And Jim Rohn said, The greatest reward in becoming a millionaire is not the amount of money that you earn. It's the kind of person that you have be, to become uh, to become a millionaire. Most people want everything to be magically uh, to work for them. And um, so for their, they, they wish their circumstances would magically change for them. They don't have the desire to become better themselves so they can proactively improve their own circumstances. Unlike most people who simply wait and wish for luck, you can seek to become the kind of person equipped for the skills and abilities to do brilliant things. You can become the kind of person who does highly influential work. Your work can solve pressing problems, improve people's lives, and get noticed by important people who share your work not for your sake but for theirs. Sharing your work makes them look good because of how great it is. The quality of who you are as a person and the work you do is completely within your control. But you can't wish for it to happen. You must become the kind of person who naturally attracts the success you seek. So uh, there are certain things that you need to do in order for you to attract the success that you seek. And I will start with investing at least 10% of your income in yourself. If you don't pay for something, you rarely pay attention. Most people want stuff that's free. But if you get something for free, you rarely prize that thing. You rarely take it seriously. How much do you invest in yourself? How committed are you to yourself? If you aren't investing in yourself, then you don't have any skin in the game of your own life. So, if you aren't invested in your in your uh, position, you probably won't go do high quality work. And if you are not invested in your relationships, you're probably more focused on what you can get than what you can give. When it comes to self improvement, investing ten percent of your income on yourself will yield a hundred times or more return on that investment. For every dollar you spend on your education, skills, and relationships, you will get at least a hundred dollars back in return. If you want to do something extremely well, you need to surround yourself with the right mentors. Anything that you will ever do well will be the result of high-quality mentoring. If you suck at something, it's because you haven't received quality mentoring in that thing. The best mentorships are the ones where you pay your mentor. Often the more you pay, the better, because you will take the relationship far more seriously. You won't solely be taking in that relationship. You won't purely be a consumer. A consumer. Instead, you'll be invested, and as such, you will listen more carefully. You'll care more. You'll be more thoughtful and engaged. There will be higher consequences for not succeeding. I invest $3,000 to get help writing my first book proposal from a highly successful writer. That $3,000 got me maybe 4 to 5 hours of this of his time. But in those 4 to 5 hours, he taught me what I needed to know to create an amazing book proposal. He provided me resources that dramatically enhanced and sped up my process. With his help, I was able to get a literary, literary agent and eventually a multi-six-figure book contract. 
Had I been overly concerned about the $3,000, I'm confident that to this day I'd still not have written a book proposal. At the very most, I'd have written a terrible one. I would not have been as motivated or invested, so I would have been far more likely to procrastinate needed action. If you don't have much time, surely you can't afford to buy a book. How much money and time do you spend on entertainment, clothes, or food? It's a matter of priority. It's only when you invest in something that you have the motivation to make it happen. Beyond mentorship, you should invest in education programs such as online courses, books, quality products such as food and sleep. You, your level of success can generally be directly measured by your level of investment. If you're not getting the results you want, it's because you haven't invested enough to get those results. Your number one investment must be yourself. Who you are determines the quality of marriage you'll have, the quality of parent you become, the quality of work you produce, the level of happiness you have. Here is what you will find when you financially invest yourself in something. You become very committed to that thing. Economists call this sunk cost bias. But you can leverage this to your benefit. If you want to escalate your personal commitment to something, invest heavily in that thing. Eventually, it will become a point of no return. You will become so fiercely committed that withdrawing will seem ridiculous. Hence, you will need to truly know what you want and why. If you don't know these things, then overcommitting could be a huge and irrational problem. However, if you are certain about who you are, want to be, what you want, and why, then you need to invest in yourself. Number two, invest at least 80% of your off time into learning. Most people are consumers rather than creators. They are at work to get their paycheck, not to make a difference. When left to their own devices, most people consume their time as well. It's only by investing your time that you get a return on that time. Nearly every second spent on social media is consumed time. You can't have that time back. Rather than making your future better, it actually made your future worse. Just like eating bad food, every consumed moment leaves you worse off. Every invested moment leaves you better off. Entertainment is as well is all well and good. But only when that entertainment is an investment in your relationships or yourself, you will know if it is, if it was an investment, if that entertainment continues to yield returns over and over in your future. That may include positive memories, transformational learning, or deepened relationships. Even still, life isn't purely about being entertained. Education and learning is also key. And although both are essential, education will provide far greater returns in your future. The world's most successful people are intense learners. They are hard readers. They know that what they know determines how well they see the world. They know that what they know determines the quality of relationships they can have and the quality of work they can have. If you are constantly consuming junk media, how can you possibly expect to create high value work? Your input directly translates to your output. Garbage in, garbage out. And I want to stop here and because I'm running out of time, I will continue this topic next Wednesday, Eastern Time, 10 p.m. You are tuning in on Armed Radio and Let's Talk Careers with Sarah every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. I talk about careers and job hunting. If you would like to ask a question or would like to hear about previous shows that you have missed, you can find me on Facebook at Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. You can learn about jobs, tips, and advice on my page. If you have a career-related question, you can just message me on Facebook.